Hey everybody, welcome back to Planet Zoo. I know it's been a while since my last standalone habitat build, which, <laughs> to be honest, I only started doing those back in the beta days, I think, because I didn't have enough time to really build a full zoo, but now this is just kind of what I think I'm gonna be doing for the time being, because my computer doesn't seem to be able to handle bigger parks, um, and I just like doing these standalone habitat builds, it really allows me to focus on something specifically. But I haven't done many of these recently, really the only Planet Zoo videos that I have made are Koali Zoo ones. So you might be wondering why I wanted to get back into this at this point, and honestly it's mostly because the South American DLC as well as the free update to the game are dropping, which as this video comes out should be about today if my timing is right. So this means that we have a lot of new pieces to play with, and for me, even though I'm not building anything South American in this episode, I'm still gonna be, you know, playing with the pieces a bit and seeing what we can do. And if you're wondering why I'm not actually building something that is South American, because I'm getting very off topic probably here and doing something completely different than other YouTubers are doing, uh, well, for one, I guess it is kind of good to not do the same thing that everybody else is doing, uh, but to be totally honest, I just really, really wanted to build some Swahili architecture and just try my hand at a very particular style that I've always wanted to try and that especially now with the South American pieces, I figured would be a really, really fun concept. So you're gonna see a bit of that in a few minutes after I'm done doing all of this path work. Shout out to Mike, by the way, who I believe was the person who taught me this trick of making gentle, perfectly sloped straight paths, as you just saw me do for those two bridges. Unfortunately, uh, this very first part of the video, like only this first part where I do the path work, was done before I got my early access YouTuber special code to play the DLC. So at that point, I didn't have the fine-tuned path uh, sort of mechanics that come with the new update of the game but and I believe this is included in the free update actually along with the glass pieces the path system has been improved and now you can make much more gentle slopes more easily and naturally so that's really awesome so it kind of means that what I just did that trick with the flat roof pieces and trying to align my paths with them <laughs> was kind of unnecessary but hey Shout out to Mike anyway for showing me that trick, that was uh, really the OG way to get gentle slopes in paths until now the new days with his DLC uh, and the free updates actually where you can finally much more easily get some smoother sloped paths which is really awesome. I know that the, uh, the path system has always been one of the biggest main gripes that people have with this game and Planet Coaster as well and honestly the same goes for me. The path system is just one of my biggest problems with this game overall. It's just something that apparently I've been told a few times is really difficult to overcome because it's kind of hard baked into the engine and the way that it works with the, the voxel terrain. But at least with these uh, improvements in slopes, it'll be a bit easier to make more smooth flowing paths. So that's really awesome. So whatever agony you just told me go through, it's not entirely necessary anymore. Uh, and for this part of this path, honestly, I couldn't be bothered anymore, so I just decided to make this a purely aesthetic path that's there for a suspense of disbelief that this park is going to be ADA compliable, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's gonna allow for people in wheelchairs or other disabilities to actually get to the habitat as well, so I wanted to, you know, get that out of the way before I moved into anything else. And this has also been a bit of a struggle with Kuali Zoo, I think, recently, because, well, Mike has built a bunch of really amazing, beautiful areas which are very hard to access by wheelchair. So I'm going to try my best to not forget about them in this build and include all kinds of very gentle ramps, which should hopefully be fine. I think, technically, this ramp is slightly steeper than what is allowed by ADA... Uh, measurements. I don't actually know about European standards because I'm really only thinking about the American Disabilities Act here. Um, going a bit off topic also, but yeah, just just trying to look out for my, you know, non-able-bodied people as well, right? Um, so it's going to be interesting because I wanted to raise the general surrounding of the lion habitat so that you look down into it and there's also a natural uh, kind of cliff between the path and the habitat itself so that there's not much blocking the view and that it doesn't really feel like, you know, the animals are caged in some kind of man-made structure, but rather 
it flows smoothly into a natural landscape. But to, in order to do that, of course, I had to connect the paths to some other level as well. So I just decided to have some pathwork shenanigans at the start of this build. Uh, which for me is also kind of unusual because normally I start off with buildings and just kind of go from there because they're more or less my, my favorite thing to work on. But for this build, I just wanted to get a little bit of context in first, see how everything would work and how the buildings would be placed. Uh, and only after that, figure out my sight lines and how the whole structure is going to come together. And I'm very glad I did this because I recorded this before I got my early access copy of the DLC and the free update of the game. So once I did get it, I could move straight into building buildings and testing some of the new pieces, which to be honest, I won't be doing that much um, because I can still fall back on a lot of the old pieces as well. But I would not have been able to make what I'm making in this video without the, the new pieces. Um, mostly because the South American pieces have some really great stone items that are super useful for this team as well. So let's get it over with and actually get started with building. And this is one of my, uh, my first discoveries that I sort of made when I opened the DLC, looked around for pieces and, you know, tried to see these pieces are made for South American temple structures, but what else can we also use these for? Like, how versatile are these pieces? Because those are, for me at least, my main questions. I like following the themes that the game gives sometimes, but more than that, I just like taking the pieces and putting them to different uses and trying to see how versatile they are, using them in all kinds of contexts. So that's uh, that was kind of my goal here as well. And I love these temple floor pieces because it's just the kind of recolorable stone texture that I think the game was kind of missing and in general I'm really glad actually that this pack has a lot of recolorable pieces uh, stone textures as well because so far Planet Zoo has been following an approach where natural items as in items that have some kind of natural texture that doesn't change aren't recolorable and the only recolorable items are the ones that realistically in a real life scenario would be recolorable either because they're painted or um, because there's something that could be baked in different colors. And I'm really glad that we now have more pieces that are recolorable that actually have more natural stone uh, textures as well, because it's just something that allows you to have more variety in your build. Like, I'm going to use some stone pieces throughout this facade here, and in different places I want to use slightly different colors so that there's just a bit more variety, which is... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just really glad that made its way into the game. Now to actually talk about the architecture, I think what started this off in my head uh, was maybe over a year ago already, because uh, back at that point, a Twitter user called Igbo Excellence posted a big thread on Twitter um, explaining all the, the, the great things that African architecture has achieved and that it's very underrated, which uh, by the way, I totally agree. That was a really, really cool tweet that I think opened up a lot of people's eyes on African architecture, which tends to be quite underlooked compared to other regions in the world. Uh, and he just provided all kinds of examples from different countries and cultural backgrounds. That was really cool. And from this, I think it was that I found uh, a picture of Lamu in Kenya, where there is a very specific type of Swahili architecture, which almost blends some influences of Middle Eastern architecture as well because it's right on the same coast and used to be part of uh, very similar trade routes and it's just super awesome. So I think that's where my inspiration came from. I ended up following him on Twitter as well but then after posting about architecture he just started being horny on his main and I wasn't really on Twitter looking for pictures of women. I'm really there only to look at pictures of buildings of course. So. I had to unfollow sadly, but still, shout out to Igbo for making a really amazing Twitter thread and um, getting a lot of people inspired when it comes to African architecture because there's some really cool stuff out there. Uh, so in general, what this kind of Swahili architecture looks like is a lot of um, white, very yeah, straight walls with not even that much detail, but just a wonderful like natural textures. Um, with also mangrove wooden support structures and details, uh, which is really cool. So I, I love the context uh, or the contest between this this white uh, simple wall textures and then the very sparse wooden detailing and supports on these buildings, and sometimes also some thatch roofs, uh, which 
I was actually looking into recently are apparently called Makuti. I, uh, I'm probably mispronouncing literally everything I'm saying in this video. Uh, but yeah, it's just a really cool, simple style that doesn't take too many items. If you're looking at Planet Zoo, for instance, and how you could build it in this game. Uh, but it very quickly comes together in a, in a really beautiful picture. Um, it's also really cool because you can play a lot with depth because the, the textures and detailing is so simple and pretty laid back uh, that really uh, the interesting thing to play with is composition and depth in some of your buildings, I think. Um, so that's also what I'm doing here a lot. You barely find any straight pieces or uh, boxy parts of this building. Everything's kind of set back from each other or overhanging something else uh, and placed at a slightly different angle. Uh, which altogether creates this really interesting sort of rhapsody of simple parts of the building. I've also found that a lot of these buildings tend to have uh, vertical but also horizontal support beams uh, made out of mangrove wood, which I wanted to bring back into this building as well with the porch for instance, which is raised on the left side there, uh, kind of like a, a trellis almost. And of course all of the little windows as well. Now I'm making this building out of the uh, the plaster pieces because they're just so versatile. I still love them so much. Um, and in that sense, the way that I'm working this is kind of inspired by Telico, which is an old planet coaster project by Free the Bear and Atfo TV, which isn't even finished as I'm speaking. It's something that's been going for years. But it uses very similar architecture, and back then they used uh, windows, the, the backside of windows in Planet Coaster to make these walls. Obviously, we have the plaster pieces nowadays, which is much easier and much less heavy on your computer, but the same kind of way of working still stands. Very few of the walls are actually made out of wall pieces. Everything is made out of plaster pieces, just because it allows for that versatility uh, of creating walls that are um, maybe smaller than the in-game wall pieces are, or making holes here and there for the windows. It's just super simple, you don't see too much detail on it, but at the same time it looks more organic, I think, than you know if you make everything out of just simple walls and slap details on top of that. Um, so moving on from that, I did want to add a section where this building actually has some kind of function. Now. Of course, I'm building this as a separate habitat, but within my suspense of disbelief, the idea would be that this is some kind of themed area within an existing zoo. So I wanted to feature a kind of restaurant, have this as an overlook and resting area next to the habitat. So I wanted to have some functionality to it as well. So I'm just adding two stalls here for food and drinks, and that's about it. Supposedly this whole building would be, you know, one big restaurant, but I'm not going to go into interiors for anything like that because it's quite a closed building. So let's just imagine that a restaurant would be in the middle of this when in reality, of course, within the game, there are just two stalls and not much else you can really do with it. Now it was at this point that I really wanted to feature some uh, thatch roofs as well because otherwise I figured it would be getting quite simple and this is also where I think the inspiration from the town of Lamu is becoming very clear which is a town on the coast of Kenya which still has a lot of very old Swahili architecture looks quite similar to this I would say or at least I'm trying to make it look uh, very similar um, and also features a lot of these white walls with uh, thatch roof um, which are interesting because these thatch roofs are never really the same as um, the gabled thatch roofs that you can find, for instance, in Indonesia or so, uh, because they all have just corners like this, like none of them have actual gable facades. So that's something that I tried to also copy. Uh, does make my work a little bit easier because it means that the woodwork that I have to do is a lot more simple. Although I also have to say, that's a bit of a bummer because I would love to do a bit more woodwork. One of the coolest things, at least in my opinion, that were added in this new uh, DLC, uh, specifically in the South American pack, this is not something that's part of the free update, is uh, bamboo pieces, which I'm also kind of mad about because if you remember my last video in Koali Zoo, I built this 
a big chimpanzee lookout structure out of wooden posts and the idea was to make it look as much like bamboo as possible because I wanted to build a bamboo structure um, but we didn't have the pieces back then and now just a week later well actually maybe like two weeks later I see that they added those pieces into the game so I'm kind of kicking myself because if I would have waited you know my next turn to build this structure I would have had the bamboo pieces by now uh, but alas, anyway, I shouldn't complain about it because these bamboo pieces are absolutely awesome because not only are there simple bamboo pieces that aren't recolorable, just have a natural bamboo uh, texture, uh, there are also recolorable ones. So you can make these any color you want and there are thick ones and thin ones. Um, so I use these things more or less throughout this build to resemble the mangrove beans uh, beams that you would see in real life. Uh, and another really cool part about them is that they have fitting rope pieces where it's just a bunch of rope twisted around the bamboo and it's something that's not actually within the bamboo pieces but it's something that you can separately place on top of them so you can really create lots of wooden structures and then put ropes around them as if you know they aren't nailed together but they're held together by ropes which is something that back in planet coaster i think we always tried doing uh with a little hanging rope piece but that never really you know looked perfect uh, but these new rope pieces are super cool and i actually can't wait to see what people end up doing with them it's really great for all kinds of adventurous themes or um, african or southeast asian themes i think Another thing that I think is really cool is for the new temple pieces, that is the, uh, the sort of Aztec, uh, like South American temple pieces, there are wall sets, but there aren't any big ruined walls, like there aren't actual wall pieces. The only thing that they provided are uh, big brick pieces that are off the grid that you can put together in whatever way you want to yourself, um, which makes them kind of more difficult to work with because you can't just plop down a few walls and call it a day uh, but they are super versatile so you can basically make any kind of large stone brick pattern that you want and I ended up making this pattern for uh, this lookout structure on the left side here where the path pops out a bit you have this curve going to the uh, the outside into the uh, into the what is the going to be the future habitat for the lions and for that one I just wanted to have a different texture to it than the uh, the rock cliff that we have next to the building here uh, so yeah I really love those pieces as well it's just a kind of really versatile thing and also there are natural non recolorable piece, uh, versions of that but there's also a recolorable version for every piece in that set so honestly as much as I've complained in the past about uh, Planet Zoo pieces not being recolorable and honestly I thought the whole rule about you know natural textures um, not being recolorable because it would look bad I kind of found that some nonsense because well at the end of the day I feel like it should be people's choice whether they want to recolor something or not I'm, I'm super glad and really just happy overall that we do have a lot of recolorable versions of the pieces in this pack because it just makes everything so versatile and I can see many of these pieces being useful outside of the context of just a South American theme. Now for these bridges, I'm kind of going back to some of the older pieces, but I also use the bamboo pieces as the uh, railings on the first one. Because honestly, if you recolor them in, uh, in a dark wooden color, you can pretty much use them for any, anything that you need a narrow piece of wood for. So that's what I ended up, that's what I ended up doing for that bridge. And then for the second bridge, just a slightly different kind of overall design, I just ended up adding some uh, Indian pieces to create the fence on the side. Now I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here, um, as I just placed down some foliage around the building, to a section where I'm building a sort of interior section. It's not quite an interior, um, but this is going to be the placeholder for what would have been a real restaurant inside this building, uh, but now it just leads to a few stalls. But I wanted to play a little bit with the uh, interiors. I've, so I've seen a bunch of pictures of Swahili architecture where they have these large mangrove beams on the beams on the ceiling, um, and it just looks super cool. And I figured that's something I wanted to try. It's very similar, actually, in some ways to some of the ceilings that you can find in maybe European alpine architecture. 
Um, but yeah, I'm just keeping it very simple other than that. Just a few pots and planters and wall decorations and that's gonna be it. The building is not really meant to, you know, look into, but just as a... Uh, to give a general idea that there is something inside that building. Now for this little tower on the side, there was something that I wanted to experiment with a bit, which didn't work out as well as I'd hoped for this theme, but I think it worked out really well with certain themes, and that is using some of these temple bricks uh, to create brick uh, details on stucco buildings, which, especially for maybe European themes or something like that, would be really cool, uh, because these bricks have just the right size for any kind of natural stone texture, so you can really blend them into the, the stucco buildings as well and create some really interesting textures for yourself. These are honestly, and I think I recently had a conversation with somebody about this, about this. Uh, these are honestly the kind of pieces that, as a, as a core player, if you will, of these games, who, who, who plays it a lot and just works with all the pieces a million times, these tiny little objects that seem pretty redundant in the grand scheme of things are always the pieces that I look, to, uh, look forward to most. Uh, I think, for example, in, in Planet Coaster, there were a bunch of times where a new update would just bring this very small wooden beam into the game. And, you know, as, as a game developing company, I don't think you expect too much out of those pieces. But in the Planet Coaster discords, people would go wild over these little things because every tiny piece just allows you to bring so much more texture and detail into any kind of wall or roof that you're building. Uh, and I think a lot of this goes for the South American pack as well. There's just so many of these new items they can use that are ver very versatile, but also just really simple, very small, simple pieces that you can use in different contexts. And especially because some of them are recolorable as well, are just going to be so useful in different themes. Now, I'm coming to the end of the facade here and I kind of lose my care for how this ends up looking because the focus of this general row of buildings is on the front, which I'd say is by the two bridges with the tower as well, and the rest kind of curves away from this. I really wanted to create this, uh, this sense also where if you're walking toward this building, it feels like you have a very, uh, <laughs> a very high FOV as in a video game, like you're looking through a fisheye lens because all of the buildings are curving outward from each other uh, and also moving down so it really creates this sense of forced perspective where the building seems uh, bigger and more impressive than it really is and you really have to see it from that particular angle you really have to see it from the front for this to work like this row of building looks significantly worse and kind of terrible from some other angles um, so as we get to the end of this uh, this facade I'm also going to step down the buildings in terms of detail and in terms of height as well. So these last few facades aren't quite as interesting anymore, uh, but they're still really uh, important for finishing you know, the, the general shape of the building and also for making this large enough to realistically, believably, be some kind of restaurant building inside a real time, uh, in inside a real life zoo. And now it is uh, finally time to get to the actual habitat. I know, it took way too long to actually build this habitat, but to be fair, there just isn't that much to it. And I think a lot of the detail and charm of it really comes from the areas that the guests are walking around in. I am trying to adhere to some of the basic rules of, well, habitat design that I set for myself or that just kind of exist in general. In a sense that, for one, I'm trying to make this, of course, as natural as possible and just trying to emulate the, the look of an African grassland. But also, for all of the uh, very man-made architecture that I'm building in this episode, I really want to keep that strictly for the areas where the guests will be. So, the shelter for the lions is going to be much more simple and much more natural. Um, just a simple cave structure where it also connects to the um, the holding area behind it and the uh, the staff area where they could prepare food or care for the animals. Um, so all of that is going to be much more simple and natural. And then the actual human architecture is only at the places where people are going to be walking around. 
Now I'm breaking some of the rules of making habitats here. Uh, one of which is to try and create very specific sight lines where guests don't see other guests at the end of their viewing platform. Um, because ideally, you want to kind of gaze into an animal's habitat and not see people behind the animal that you're looking at. And there are a few sight lines crossing here, mostly just because I wanted to create the right sight lines for the buildings as well. So I'm kind of uh, putting the buildings above animals for that section there. I think the best views of the habitat would actually be from right uh, underneath the buildings where you do look into the animal habitat and in the backdrop you see uh, the cave with uh, the shelter. So that works much better. And another thing that I'm kind of breaking is the fact that this habitat does have some very corner-y bits where uh, realistically you want to make sure that a habitat is built in such a way that your, your animals can walk around it and especially with big cats that they can walk around their territory but especially that nobody can get cornered um, because you don't want any animals to be like socially uh, pushed out from the group and cornered in any certain space and especially underneath the bridge I do have some pretty bad shapes of this habitat uh, because I think a lion could definitely be cornered there even though there are two sides of the pond and they could walk around it as well. It's uh, something that definitely diminishes the realism of this habitat. So that's a bit unfortunate. Honestly, I was just so hyped about this architecture and the new pieces that I wanted to try that I kind of lost sight of exactly how this uh, exhibit should realistically be. Um, but honestly, I also think at the end of the day it's not terrible and the lions in the game are very happy with it. It's just about the right size and nature wise quite decent. It's just that it's it's sometimes guilty of doing this thing where the uh, the human architecture and sight lines and how the uh, the habitat aesthetically looks is prioritized over the actual animal welfare. Because as we all know, animals don't care for how any of this looks and what's much more important is just the social dynamics and how they are cared for um, and just their basic needs. But then again, architecture and landscaping is kind of my thing and if you ask me anything about animals aside from what is inside the Zoopedia of Planet Zoo, I'm probably not going to be able to give the best answers anyway, so you're just going to have to forgive me for that. These are my weaknesses and strengths personally. Uh, but altogether, I'm still really happy with how this came out. Um, I think it's a decent showcase also of what the new pieces in the DLC can do, uh, because they can do so much more than just South American architecture, and I'm really happy about that. So um, yeah, I'm going to share with you some cinematic shots and leave it at that. Hopefully I'll see you in the next episode of whatever random habitat it is, or perhaps even in Kuali Zoo, because it is my turn this week, so we'll see how that goes. Bye everybody, and stay safe, stay at home, and let's just keep playing video games, right? I don't know, personally I'm really glad to have this hobby because it's definitely something that in self-isolation still works really well, and it's just fun to be part of this online community and share stuff around, you know? So let's just keep doing that. Anyway, I'll see myself out.